After last week's sermon, uh, someone approached me and asked that I preach a sermon on uh, based upon a question because the box is there for you to put questions in. And they said, well, uh, if you don't mind, I'll just tell you. And I said, no problem. And so they said, what if someone, you do something to someone, uh, can you just pray to God for forgiveness and that be it? Or do you have to go and talk to that person? So that is the question that I'm going to address this morning. So keep that in mind. Do you have the responsibility to go to the person and confess your fault, to ask them for forgiveness, even though you've asked God for forgiveness? Well, to begin with, we will notice in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. So God's Word is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. We would also see in Hebrews chapter 12, the first part of that verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. I would like to emphasize the weight there. What is this weight? Well, we would, I would say that this weight is things that hold us back from our full potential. If that's your hobby, if that's your job, if that's your family, whatever that is, whatever that weight may be. And we all know that things that are good in and of themselves can become burdensome. They can become bad if we allow them to be so. Nothing wrong with the family, right? God instituted. But if you do not love God more than your family, they could become a weight and possibly even a sin. But that's really what I'm wanting to point out is that in this context, you notice that there's a difference between the two. There's a conjunction and, but it is the weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. So that means that there are two different things that he's dealing with. And so what I want to point out, right out of the gate, you might say, is there are going to be times when we're going to be more sensitive to people than maybe we should be. Maybe that circumstance is a little bit different from time to time or how we feel. So I make a distinction between sin and feelings. Can you sin against someone? Absolutely, you can sin against someone. We'll address that here in just a moment. Can you hurt their feelings? Absolutely. By hurting their feelings, have you sinned against them? Have you put a stumbling block in front of them? Have you offended them? That's what offended means. It means, biblically, it means that you have caused them to stumble. That's a very serious accusation. So serious that Jesus says that if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it'd be better for you to have a a millstone wrapped around your neck and thrown into the deep. Serious. So don't be so quick to say, you offended me, because that's worthy of death, in essence. Hurt Your hurt feelings, though... I don't know. And there are a lot of people who keep their feelings out here. So easily hurt. And I'm going to equate that to this weight, you might say, that there's a distinction between this weight. It hasn't really become a sin. It could be, but it's certainly holding you back from your full potential. Yes, you hurt my feelings, but is that something that I should make a mountain out of a molehill? Am I being too sensitive? Maybe that person was just absolutely kidding, didn't mean anything by it. It was how it was taken. And there's a, a billion different scenarios, right? We all understand that. 
Then this next verse in Romans chapter 15 and verse 14 really rings true in this idea, even though we're talking about forgiveness, I'm wanting to talk about hurting one another's feelings along the way. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Now admonishing is not rebuking. There is a difference between those two. And we've already pointed out that the, the, the scriptures, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, correction, and instruction. So admonishment's not mentioned in this context, but admonishment's the kind of the idea that you fell short. And it is the, the, the idea that you can, you put your arm around someone and say, you could have done better. You should have done better. Did they fail? No, they didn't absolutely just fail. They didn't necessarily sin, but, mm, you did not reach your full potential. You could have done a better job. You could have been more prepared. You could have whatever it is, right? Now, none of us want to be corrected. No one wants to be rebuked. No one wants to be corrected under any circumstances. We don't typically sign up for that. That's not our norm. We don't normally sign up for criticism, but I hope that you are open to correction and criticism. And to be frank about it, if you're not, you shouldn't be a Christian. Because, see, you and I are trying to help one another become stronger and better Christians, better servants in the kingdom. And just because you're admonished and just because you're corrected doesn't mean you just absolutely failed. But there's room for improvement. And I hear all kinds of excuses. I've been a... A Christian for 50 years. So you're above reproach? You can't improve? And I find it so interesting also that there are many, many people who are over here on this side who say, I'm a sinner, I sin. Sometimes they even say they sin all the time. And then someone comes and says, you know what? You could have done something better. You, I, I see in, in your life there's something that kind of concerns me, and I want to talk to you about it. And then what, what happens? Boy, they just, who are you to judge me? Who are you to correct me? Have you ever done that? <laughs> On this hand, I'm a sinner. No one's perfect. I tried my best, but I still... And then someone corrects you, and all of a sudden you became the most pious individual. Self-righteous is really what we've just become. Is it just me, or have you ever seen that in yourself or in others? Isn't that strange? Don't you find that strange? I find that strange. Very, very interesting. So, addressing the question... In regard to, do you have to go to that person to acknowledge your sin, to repent, to ask them for forgiveness? It really does begin with God. So our lesson is titled, Asking for Forgiveness. And in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's part of the model prayer. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We see in that context that you have to confess your sins. Now, I must say that in the context, it's, it's certainly to God. But it wouldn't end there. But in Acts chapter 8 and verse 20, this is a very interesting passage here. You're very familiar with the context. In Acts chapter 8, you have Philip going to Samaria. And here in Samaria, he has been preaching. Begins in verse 5. 
He's preaching Christ to them. Many become obedient. Even one by the name of Simon the sorcerer. He believes, and when Peter and John come and lay hands on those who have been baptized into Christ to receive the Holy Spirit, he wants to buy it so he can do the same. And so we pick up in verse 18. Now, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right. In the sight of God, repent, therefore, of your wickedness and pray that God, excuse me, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. So Peter says, you better ask for forgiveness. You better repent right now. Do not delay. In verse 23, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Maybe by the will of God, Peter was able to look into his heart. Boy, I, I, I hope so. If not, he still, he gave them both barrels, didn't he? So Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. No doubt we have to repent of our sins. We have to make an about face. We're headed in this direction and we make an about face and head in the other direction. It's actually a military term. And that's what it is. You make an about face. There's no kind of changing your direction. It is doing the opposite. Repentance. So, what about asking your brother for repentance. Is there any instruction in God's Word regarding that? Well, of course there is. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23. We'll begin there. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar. Go and tell all your friends... (laughs) That you have sinned against someone. Is that what it says? Isn't that ironic, though, that when we're hurt, when our feelings are hurt, or possibly if someone has sinned against us, we have a tendency to go to everybody but the person who did it? In this case, it's the other way around. You have Sinned against your brother, or excuse me, I take that back. Let's read the context. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, remember that your brother has something against you. Now, it does not say sin there. Your brother has something against you. For me, that opens that door that it may not just be sin. It could be that they hurt your feelings. If you can't get over that, the other person can't get over that, then you have a responsibility to immediately do something about it. It, It's amazing how sometimes we treat our loved ones, whether it's our loved ones in our immediate family or our our extended family, that idea that we give them the cold shoulder. We want them to figure out that they've hurt us, that they've sinned against us. They may not know, remember. But we want them to figure it out. Have you ever done that to your spouse? Have you ever slept as far to the edge of the bed as you possibly could, (laughs) the opposite end of where your spouse is laying? You're not going to go sleep on the couch because your bed's a lot more comfortable, but... You'll just get as far away from them as you can. 
The next morning, you don't say hello. You don't say good morning. You just go about your business. You don't give the kiss goodbye. You walk out the door and you want them to figure out that you are not happy with them. You ever done that? Anyone? No one? No one's given their spouse the cold shoulder before? Silent treatment? So I find it very, very, very discouraging that I have to figure out whether you got something against me or not. But if I find out, guess what? I'm going to talk to you. Because that's what we have to do. So therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, what is he doing? He's going to worship. He's going to worship. And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there, Jesus says. Leave your gift there before the altar. Don't make your sacrifice to me, to God. And go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. You see how important unity is to God? Do you see how important it is for us to work out our problems? Do you see how important love should be? That it should triumph everything. I don't give you the cold shoulder. I don't shake your hand, try to prove to you that I got something you got under my skin. You talk about childish. You talk about childish, how we treat one another sometimes. You can't, if, if they are holding a grudge and you find out, you need to go and take care of it. It does not say sin. It just says if your brother has ought against you, has something against you. And we don't need to go and dig into the Greek and try to figure out what that is. That's what it means. I looked at a lot of different translations. It's, that's what it means. The seriousness of this in verse 25 is agree with your adversary quickly. The guy that's got something against you, go to him immediately. Leave your gift there at the altar. Don't even come and worship me, God says. You go and take care of this problem right now. You find out right here in the assembly before worship begins, guess what? You go in a back classroom or something and work it out. You don't come and worship. Do you get that? Do you see the seriousness that God places upon this? Don't even come and worship me till you get this taken care of. Why? Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hands you over to the officer. You think about the bailiff in that sense. And you be thrown into prison. You're cuffed. And you're hauled away. But surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Then you can go and worship in unity like we ought to. In James chapter 5 and verse 16, I believe that that's really the context. You know, we kind of scratch our heads because it says there, confess your sins one to another. Well, should we just parade ourselves in front of everybody every time we meet? Okay, I, I lost my temper Tuesday. I'm here to tell you. We make our confession. Next! We just file through. What's the context here? If you notice over in James chapter 5, it would seem that this guy's on his deathbed. It's a, a serious matter. Um, maybe that might be a little harsh, but there's some urgency to this circumstance. Well, let's go ahead and uh, start at verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil. That's medicinally doing whatever you can, physically in that sense. 
in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. So they're going to pray for him, obviously. And that's the spiritual side. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. But then it says in verse 16, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. To me, what this is saying, what my understanding is, is that if you ask for forgiveness and the elders are even praying on your behalf that your sins be forgiven, not that you could pray that someone else's sins are forgiven while they remain in opposition, in rebellion, but that idea where he wants to be right before God. He's going to repent of his sins. The elders are going to pray for him in that regard. Why is verse 16 there? Confess your trespasses. Do you see the connection between that and Matthew chapter 5? To truly be forgiven by God requires us to be forgiven by our brethren. Or at least the attempt. The question is, you know that someone's got ought against you. They haven't come to you. You know, you got to find that out. And I can tell you stories about that. <sighs> I've had, I have gone to meet with all the elders. And the elders say, you know, there's a problem, da da la da la 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 Well, who is it? Who, who has the, the problem with me? Oh, we can't tell you that. That person goes to the elders to complain about the preacher, to complain about me, but they're not going to tell me who they are so I can go and take care of it. Do you see the fallacy of that? Do you see how doctrinally wrong that is? And I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me. I don't know if I can count that high. That's a, an exaggeration, but you get the point. Of elders, shepherds of the flock. I had a shepherd come to me one time and say that, uh, well, there, there's some people who are you know, upset that you did this or said this and that and Okay, well, who are they? Uh, I'm not going to tell you. I went to every member of the congregation, and guess what I found out? It was his children who are grown, who have children of their own. Well, you guys start playing these stupid, devilish games. You got ought against your brother, you go and talk to them. Period. Go and talk to them. We're supposed to be getting along. It would seem that this guy is in, it's, he's bad enough. He's sick enough that he's called the elders. They've anointed him. They've done what they can physically for him. They've prayed for him because his spiritual circumstance is much more important than his physical circumstance because he will die one day no matter what they do. And then in verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Do you think he's talking about a physical healing at this point? I don't think so. I believe that it's spiritual. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Get your differences resolved. Be reconciled. Don't let it fester. Don't let it cause separation. And we upset one another, so what do we do? We go to the next congregation. That may not be as much of an option here, although there are as there are in some metropolitan places. And you know what we call those people? Church hoppers. Someone hurts their feelings. And so instead of going and talking to the person and getting it resolved and continuing down life, because I don't know about you, but the best of friends that I've had, they've upset me and I've upset them. We get over it and we move on. How about you? Maybe not always, right? Even the best of friendships have been dissolved over one little thing. How sad. How sad. And Christians, do you think they're both going to be in heaven? So, what do you do when you find out that someone has ought against you? You go to them and you try to resolve it, but they say, no, get away from me. I don't want to talk to you. 
what do you do then? Give me book, chapter, and verse what you do then. Because I'm dealing with that right now. Right now, here in this congregation, right now. You tell me what I do. What do I do? Give me book, chapter, and verse, and I'll do it. Just like that. Because we've got to be at peace. I told y'all when I came and met with you that I am going to say something, I'm going to do something, and you're not going to like it. I'm not doing it intentional, but I said I am looking for a congregation that when that happens, you don't get rid of the preacher, you just work through it. I don't know what you're going to do. But I hope I don't have to uproot my family because God's children can't get along. If you only knew the damage that Christians have done to other Christians. Oftentimes because of feelings or the color of the carpet, you know, those scenarios that are real. So we must, must be forgiving. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. It's not an option. Don't go to hell because you're going to hold a grudge against someone. Seriously. Above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. We're going to irritate one another. Have I told you about the porcupine syndrome? You know, porcupines have these quills that stick out and, and it's in the middle of the night and they're getting cold. So they start snuggling up with one another. They start getting close to one another. But in the process of getting close, what do they do? They poke one another with their quills. They don't do it intentionally. I'm not ever going to intentionally hurt you. I, I will never do that. Well, I say I never, right? <laughs> I say that with a pure conscience right now. <laughs> I hope I never have that kind of animosity or hate towards you or anyone else to intentionally hurt you. But am I? Probably. Because it, it happens in every relationship. I don't know of any closer relationship. I mean, a man and wife become one. They're devoted to one another for the rest of their lives, and we still, you know, every now and then. So is it going to happen to us? Yes. It's going to happen to us. Can we be too sensitive? Yes. Can we be easily irritated? Yes. Can one thing lead to another? And it's really no big deal. You kind of forgot, but it happens again or whatever. And then it kind of starts building and you just don't have the guts to go and talk to them. And then what? That's why we have to show tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. But we ought to show some maturity too. We should give them the benefit of the doubt and not be so quick to condemn. We cannot hold a grudge. We must forgive. And forgiveness is conditional. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But... If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's pretty serious. Your soul is at stake. So, you have to go to that person. You have to. It's not optional. If you sinned against them, 
if you hurt their feelings, you are responsible to go and talk to them. Period. God allows no room for a lack of love. I don't have this next one on there. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. The word hate there can mean detest. But it also can mean that you just love your brother less, less than you ought. What is the criteria then? What, I can't think of the, the perfect word, the, the, you know, the, what is a list of things that would identify? What are the identifiers that you hate your brother? You love him less. Will you go to their house? Or would you refuse? When you see them in Walmart, do you go another direction to avoid them? Would you go up and, and ask if they need anything? Would you help them? It, is there any reluctance? Is there any backing up to do what you ought to do to them? Or do for them, that is. Uh, let me give you biblical examples. In Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew 25, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. When did we ever see, I'm just paraphrasing, when did we ever see you and, and, and do that to you? He says, when you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. So if there's any reluctance to, to approach that person, to talk to that person, to carry on as you once possibly did, and it should have been a good relationship, right? Until it went sour. If there's anything that's going to cause you to not treat your brother with the utmost love, so much love you would die for them. That's the kind of love. Sacrificial love you would die for them. And please don't say, oh, well, I would die for them, but I don't want to shake their hand. Please don't tell me that, okay? <laughs> then you hate your brother. It's that simple. It's that simple. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, loves him less, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. There's the instruction. Now, are we going to live it? Or do we make excuses for ourselves? Do we say, well, I, I'll, I'll let go the, the hurt that I have towards that individual. But you keep thinking about it. It starts affecting your relationship with them. Or, and this is really our case scenario, they are doing that to you. And you find out. You are the one that has to man up. And I say that to my girls too, so don't take it offensively, women. <laughs> I tell my girls, come on, man up, about whatever. So you got to take responsibility and go to them. Now, we know Matthew 18, right? Matthew 18 says that if your brother has sinned against you, go and tell him his fault. That's their, that's their responsibility. They're supposed to come to you, but they haven't. But in the meantime, somehow, some way you find out. Guess what? You're the one that has to have the guts, the courage, the strength to go and say, have I said or done something that's hurt you? However you want to open that conversation up with love. What did I say? What did I do? I feel. Remember, we went through a, a series of lessons. It was eight lessons, in fact. And uh, when, I, when I first came, and it was 
about these types of situations that we're going to have. They're, they're, they're going to have. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And I've already approached some of you and said, you know, is there, is there something come up between us? Did I say or do something? I'm not going to ask for hands. You know who you are. Because I just felt that. I, and they're, no. Nothing. Okay, good. Don't make them have to do that. Don't make someone that you, that, that, that's hurt you have to come to you if they don't even know that they hurt you. You go to them. Go to them. But again, if you sinned against your brother, you have to ask them for forgiveness along with God. You have to get that resolved as much as depends on you. Because that's the unity in John chapter 17 that God desires. That we be unified as much as He and the Father are unified. Where's the division among them? So one's soul is in jeopardy until he confesses his fault to the other repents and asks for forgiveness. Then and only then can you be one with the Father. God says, don't even come and worship me until you get this taken care of. God wants us to be unified. One with Him. Vertically. And one with one another. And I still find it absolutely amazing that He wants this to be taken care of between us before we'll even go and worship Him. Thank you for your attention. If there's something that you disagree with, I'll be more than happy to sit down with you. And uh, we can you know, work through this because I only want to preach what is truth. And this is just one of those things that we know it, but it's a whole lot easier to... to it's easier to backbite. It's easier to hold the grudge, it's easier to complain about it and so on and so forth and not go and talk to the person. And there's just some things that are hard in life. But the quicker you take care of it, the better. That second, that second. <laughs> the jail, the prison, I believe, in Matthew 5 is hell. It's that serious. So may we be united in love and devotion to one another in peace. In love as we have been loved. Christ gave His life for us. There's no greater love than for a friend to die for another. and That's what He's done for us. Are you willing to die with Him? You can do that this morning in the waters of baptism if you will repent of your sins, put God in control, and serve Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you're ready to do that, won't you come?